Um, I'll dive in on our presentation on blue foods and their um, role in achieving global food and nutrition security. Um, I'll try to go quickly so we have some time for discussion through the importance of blue foods, some of our emerging blue food science work, and then I'll hand it over to Carly to talk about and polish the initiatives that we're working on to leverage the role of blue foods towards food system transformation. So what do we mean by blue foods? Um, this is any of the fish, shellfish, and aquatic plants that are cultivated or harvested in oceans, lakes, rivers. So this includes both marine and inland fisheries, as well as aquaculture. And while we've known for a long time that fish are quite nutritious and a primary source of protein for over 3 billion people, it's really just been in the past decade or so that we've come to realize just how critical blue foods are for providing essential micronutrients so these are vitamins and minerals like zinc and vitamin A that are critical for childhood survival and growth, um, omega-3s that promote brain function and development, calcium and iron, all of these really support childhood development and growth and maternal health, um, as well as functioning and, and thriving healthy communities. Um, I think Ife and Moniba did a really comprehensive job of describing the importance and role of blue foods for health and livelihoods, particularly on the African continent, um, especially through small scale production. So I'll just add that there's also increasing research showing that blue foods um, are also more environmentally friendly than other forms of animal protein. They have a much lower greenhouse gas footprint, um, as well as resource use of land and water. However, um, there's challenges that these systems face. Um, Ife described the role of overfishing and, and illegal fishing and depleting these blue foods resources, um, as well as the impacts of climate change on their productivity. I'll also add that warming waters are redistributing fish stocks around the globe. And generally we're seeing a movement of fish out of the warming tropics where populations tend to be the most dependent on blue foods for their nutrition and health um, into more temperate and polar zones. There's also a broader suite of food and health policy challenges where fish are treated as commodities or natural resources and not recognized for their role in health and nutrition. So they might be, be neglected in food or nutrition policies, whereas fishery managers um, might be making decisions without considering the nutritional perspective. So how to address these challenges is a really rapidly evolving space in the research community. Um, there have been brand new collaborations among public health scientists and ecologists to quantify the nutrient composition of all of these different aquatic species, um, innovative approaches to try to understand their role in food systems and meeting nutrition goals. And so what we're trying to do at Environmental Defense Fund is to bring this cutting edge research together into synthesis that can provide tools and guidance for policymakers um, we're really trying to drive practical research agendas that can drive solutions and improve nutrient provisioning from blue foods to the populations who need them most. So I'm going to share a couple of those projects. One is to add a blue food lens to global hunger and malnutrition studies. So here um, I'm showing the in this kind of teal turquoise color. Um, the countries whose populations diets are most deficient in some of those key micronutrients that blue foods can provide overlaid in green with those countries that are most dependent on blue foods for their for their protein and diets. And when we add to that um, some research about how climate change will impact the future productivity of their fish stocks, these are those countries that are going to lose 50% or more of their yield, we can really see that those countries who are most dependent on blue foods um, are also going to be the hardest hit by climate impacts. And so this type of work can bring to light how climate justice and food justice interact and identify those countries and regions that might be priorities for aid and resource support. Here we're really seeing um, West Africa highlighted as a priority region. A second um, line of research is to analyze how global trade of seafood impacts nutrition flows. Seafood is the number one most traded commodity in the world, but it's always been talked about in terms of dollars, um, the value of those products or the volume, and we've never thought about it before from the nutrition angle. But we have a new state-of-the-art trade database that our partners have developed that can link these commodity flows to species and their nutrition content, and we can re-envision these trade flows as nutrient flows and show how trade policies or trade dynamics might be redirecting those key nutrients from the populations who need them most to 
wealthier countries that are already nutrient rich. Um, this map is just a preliminary analysis of some of the biggest flows of zinc from seafood. And you can already see this kind of movement from the global south to countries like the US and China that are already have plenty of nutrients. Um, and so it's showing how trade can really compound some of these blue injustice issues. And then a third, the third and last example is an effort to integrate all of this emerging blue foods research at a country level so that decision makers can maybe understand better the nutrition opportunities that their country's blue foods provide, some of the potential risks, and evaluate nutrition implications of fisheries or seafood policies. Um, so in Sierra Leone, we're working with some partners um, for, here's an example species, Banca shad, that's commonly caught and consumed. And what we're trying to do is communicate the value of this catch, not just in terms of its financial potential, but what's its nutritional value? How many people could we feed with this catch? So we can use this research to translate the catch volume into the nutrient yield and quantify that that 130,000 tons that were landed in 2019 represents enough protein to fulfill the dietary requirements of nearly 4 million people um, or the enough omega-3 fatty acids to fulfill the dietary needs of over 2 million people. And so this blue foods research gives us a new perspective on how to understand the benefits of this catch. And then we can start to drill down on different policies. I'm saying potential nutrition needs here because this is assuming that all of the edible portion of that catch is reaching mouths and bellies. Um, but we can use supply chain and fishing information to understand how is this really being utilized. Um, so here's that same nutrient yield in terms of the number of people's um, daily requirements that could be met in terms of protein and omega-3s, but not all of that fish is being caught domestically. Some is being allocated to foreign fleets, um, as Dipe described, or of the domestic catch, some is being exported, um, so not reaching the um, Sierra Leonese population. And so we can use this type of information to help inform the policy decisions and understand the nutrition implications, what you're losing due to these foreign fishing access agreements, due to export policies, and also um, try to explain the potential to improve nutrient provisioning through better fisheries governance, um, allowing stocks to recover, or potentially prioritizing species that might be more nutritious or more resilient to climate change. And so this is type of research is the foundation for our science-based policy advocacy. And so I'll turn it over to Carly to describe some of that. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, as Julia just walked through, there's been an incredible amount of progress that's been made in understanding the importance of blue foods. And it's been a really short period of time. So I'm going to switch a bit to uh, focus on the implications of this work in international policy and commitments. Um, as Julia mentioned, uh, this blue foods are extremely important for human health and well-being, livelihoods, but also for the environment and for climate ambitions. So much so, um, an analysis showed that blue foods make key contributions to progressing nine out of 17 SDGs. And this has been a deviation from how we typically have looked at SDGs. Blue foods has previously been really um, uh, bucketed into progressing just SDG 14 life underwater. And through these new analysis and data, it really shows how much uh, blue foods are important to progressing a handful of other SDGs. Next slide. And this really translates into how blue foods makes key contributions to many international commitments. The UN Food Systems Summit, countries came together to articulate how they want to achieve transformation of food systems through their national pathways. And for many critical countries, blue foods plays a prominent role in their pathways. At the UN C, there is an increasing focus on the role of food systems in negotiations. And as Julia mentioned, blue foods are a low carbon source. So they are important in, in thinking about how we can transition to low carbon food systems. And it also elevates the role that the oceans could play in nationally determined contributions and national adaptation plans. So it's another way to support climate ambitions and achievements that we want to reach um, towards 1.5 degrees. The Convention on Biological Diversity and the results in Global Biodiversity Framework, blue foods will play a role. As Ife already mentioned, um, they're going to be really important as we think about the context of 30 by 30 implementation. 
which is going to determine where protected areas are and what level of protection um, is going to be really important, especially for these coastal small scale communities, because that could have significant implications for local food security and access. So thinking about the role of blue foods as countries are thinking about how to achieve 30 by 30 is going to be essential. Finally, my last example is the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. This is an effort where world leaders of 17 countries have committed to build a sustainable ocean economy, which effective protection, sustainable production, and equitable prosperity go hand in hand. So there's an important role where we need to think about fisheries and aquaculture and the inclusion of small scale fishing communities in that context with the other, with the other pieces of a sustainable ocean economy. So it's really, these are just a couple examples to show how Blue Foods is a theme that connects multiple international priorities and could also advance the achievement of these priorities. Next slide. But for years, we've had a significant problem. We've been failing to think about fish as food, and this has been reflected historically about how we feed a growing population. Um, these are a couple examples of how this has been reflected. So for example, SDG 2, Zero Hunger, it really aims at achieving zero hunger through terrestrial agriculture systems. The objectives and the benchmarks do not mention fisheries or aquaculture. And as we heard already, there are so many people, over 3 billion people around the world, uh, depend on blue foods as a source of protein and vital micronutrients. And this is not reflected in these international goals. Uh, the Global Nutrition Report, which is essentially a report card on the world's nutrition from a global, regional, and a country level, and it provides information and suggestions on efforts to improve nutrition at these different scales, has not mentioned fish until 2017. So it's been a glaring gap, and Blue Foods have really been disconnected from thinking about how can we feed a, a population that's growing, especially as climate change is going to impact how we traditionally produce our food. Next slide. And this has major implications for the way that the world has invested in projects aimed at addressing hunger and malnutrition. It's led to channeling millions of tons of this nutrient-rich aquatic foods away from groups of people who need it the most. And this is a very telling graph. This is a graph of four international development banks and how they've um, allocated in their portfolios over the last 50 years towards fisheries and aquaculture. And you could see that this investment is relatively low, extremely low. Um, typically it's less than 10%. And for the most part, it's probably hovering close or under 5% over the last 50 years. So there's been very little attention from the funding community, the international community on the role that fisheries and aquaculture play in feeding the world. Next slide. So now that we have this foundational science of the importance of blue foods for nutrition and livelihoods globally, and we understand greater what's at risk, we need to inform policymaking. And this is at all levels, from global to national and local scale. There's a lot to be done, and I'm going to quickly highlight the top six policy recommendations. I think our previous panelists have really brought a lot of these recommendations, um, some more uh, details and really uh, sobering, as Julia said, examples of what this has has how this has played out on the water. Next slide. So the first recommendation is to manage blue foods as an integral part of the food systems. We need to put them at the heart of decision making around food and nutrition, and we have to start thinking of fish as food. We can no longer separate it from other land based sources of food. Next slide. We need to protect and harness diversity for nutrition, accessibility, and environmental sus sustainability. We need to manage aquatic foods as an essential uh, source of nutrients that could help mal end malnutrition. And this means prioritizing the restoration and protection of aquatic species based on nutritional rather than just economic value. Next slide. We need to identify and reform policy and practices that impede transformation, for example, uh, addressing harmful subsidies or inequitable access agreements that benefit foreign fleets, for example, versus coastal communities. Next slide. Recognize and support the central role of small scale actors. We've heard a lot about this already, but small scale fisheries supply most of the aquatic foods for direct human consumption, and about 90% of the global fishery jobs. 
So we heard earlier about spatial conflicts that occur, occur with other sectors such as oil and gas and aquaculture. And there's a real importance that we need small scale voices at the table when decisions are made, being made to ensure that these solutions and blue foods are incorporated into decision making. And this is a further emphasis. We need a commit to human rights and pol in, in policy and practice. So making sure the governments um, are including the voices of women, indigenous people, and other marginalized group and included in a meaningful way in decision-making. Next slide. We need a fun blue food research collaboration and innovation at scale. A lot of Julia's presentation on data around blue foods is relatively new. We're talking about this information. These databases have been developed over the last five to six years. So it's new and rapidly evolving, and there's more work to be done to understand the impacts of blue foods and how, how blue foods play a role in a climate-impacted world. Next slide. Uh, there is good news. Uh, we are starting to see a paradigm shift, especially over the last two years. People are starting to think about blue foods not just as a natural resource or commodity or the dollars and cents that it provides, but there's a transition in the global community to start thinking about essential blue foods and aquatic foods as essential food and nutrition. We're not there all the way, but there is a shift that's happening. One example that I like to give is in 2021 at the UN Food System Summit, it was the first international meeting where blue foods were acknowledged as a game-changing solution for food system transformation in their final statement. And we're working to make these policy recommendations a reality. Coming out of the UN Food System Summit, the Aquatic Blue Food Coalition was formed, and it currently has participation from nearly 40 governments, civil society, academic institutions, producer organizations, and others. This is an effort that is focused on two main goals within their mission. One is elevating the importance of blue foods in these international global dialogues, especially where they've been ignored for so long. And then two, mobilizing technical and financial support for countries and regions who are putting blue foods at the heart of food system decision-making. It's just been two years, but there's been a lot of progress and advancements that the coalition has made. Uh, for example, at the UN Ocean Conference, at the UNFCCC COP27, and at the UN Con Convention on Biological uh, Diversity, the coalition mobilized attention and support for blue foods in international and international efforts, and the role that they could play in protecting biodiversity and to achieve climate goals. And until this point, aquatic foods have not been a part of the conversation, and they haven't been brought um, up or voices from the blue food communities have not been present at these discussions. The coalition's also working to mobilize multilateral and private funders in support of sustainable blue foods in Africa, which is, as we heard, a critical frontier for increasing sustainable production to meet global food needs and local food needs. So this is an effort that's continuing to grow and is open for membership. So we welcome all of your participation because we want to be a diverse coalition with voices from all around the world to make this a stronger effort and to make sure that we are achieving our goals to make to have blue foods be part of the solution as we think about, think about supporting small scale communities and also feeding uh, a growing population. And it's a way to engage and elevate and think about how to include these voices in upcoming events, such as the upcoming COP and um, the UN food, stock, uh, UN food system stock taking moment in July. So I know we're close on time. I'm gonna pause there and thank you so much for allowing us to share um, some of this work. And thank you for sharing some of that work. Um, yeah, Carly and Julia, that was really wonderful. 